Now may I introduce our Dominican brother, Reverend Dr. Oliver Keenan. Very grateful to him for being our speaker tonight. Welcome, Oliver. He studied theology at St. Andrews and Oxford and is currently director of the Aquinas Institute at Blackfriars Oxford and translation fellow of the Center for Bart Studies at Princeton Theological Seminary. Oliver's main interests are contemporary theology, in particular Christology and Trinitarian theology, as well as the Catholic reception of Karl Barth. Father Oliver is a principal investigator on the Templeton Project, Truth, Aquinas, and the Theological Turn in Continental Philosophy. He has two books due out in 2023, all being well, Can Celebrating Life on the Nature and Purpose of Christian Doctrine, and why Aquinas matters. Tonight, you'll be speaking to us on a very uplifting topic, I think, in our difficult times of Aquinas on radical hope. So thank you very much, Father Oliver. Thank you, Father Dominic. Um, if there's any problem in hearing me, if somebody, uh, Father Dominic, perhaps if you just speak up and I'll uh, adjust the microphone. Or, or whatever. Um, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm just sorry that uh, we can't be together in person, but better to keep the feast and celebrate the um, uh, the great teaching of, of St. Thomas on his rightful day, even if we have to join by the medium of technology. It's slightly nerve wracking seeing you all, some old familiar faces, and I've seen a few cats wander past uh, cameras already, so I feel quite at home um, among you. Theme I've chosen actually lies outside of my um, specialist area, and I've chosen it because of what I perceive to be its crucial importance uh, in the present moment. I'm also aware that uh, for many people, hope today is as much a discipline as it is a gift, that there are people out there who are holding on to their hope by their fingernails, uh, who feel that hope is impossible or extremely hard under the present circumstances. Um, if that's you, I hope that the way I speak about hope um, and its obligatory character for the Christian is both pastorally sensitive as, as well as I hope intellectually rigorous. But just to acknowledge that there are those for whom hope is a burden in the present times. And that's one of the reasons why I've chosen the, the topic that I, I have done. What I want to do in the lecture is roughly divided into three parts. First of all, I want to uh, explain what I mean by radical hope, uh, tuning into some of the trends in contemporary philosophical reflection um, on hope. Secondly, to draw some of the resources out of St. Thomas's account of hope, not providing um, a thorough overview of uh, St. Thomas's moral theology, but just drawing out those resources which I think are helpful for and helping us to understand the phenomenon of radical hope. And then in the third and final section, I want to try and draw in some non Thomistic insights, some insights from other theological traditions, which I think might broaden or help on us to deepen our understanding of hope in the present moment. Now, I prepared a, a PowerPoint, partly to conceal the mess behind me and partly to make sure that I'm on the straight and narrow. So. I'm just going to share my screen now and uh, we can begin our walkthrough of Aquinas and radical hope. So as I said at the, at the beginning, my, uh, my research area really is systematic theology. Um, so why am I straying into the domain of hope and the, the virtue and passion of hope, a topic which usually we leave to the moral philosophers and theologians? Well, of course, there can be no doubting the political and social importance of hope uh, in the present moment. It plays an increasingly important role actually uh, within political rhetoric, but one that I think is underexplored. If we look for instance at uh, Barack Obama's hope campaign uh, and pay attention to the way in which he talks about hope during that campaign, it's very noticeable that he slips very quickly into talking about belief. It's as if he lacks a grammar or vocabulary to talk about hope, uh, he invoked it, he used it to promote his campaign, but when it came to talking about it, he lacked or seemed to lack um, a robust vocabulary. I think it's also something that has exercised a, a very formative influence over the social and political consciousness of an entire generation. When I look to the undergraduates of today, many of them grew up um, in the wake of 9-11, 
And in the oscillation between hope and despair that we've seen dominate the news cycle since then. And that oscillation is something which has really become acute during the pandemic. We've had almost on a, a daily basis oscillating between the despair of a new variant and the hope uh, that it won't uh, it won't evade the va the vaccine um, or it will prove uh, less deadly or less contagious than previous variants. We've oscillated perpetually between hope and despair, and that I think is forming the expectations of a new generation uh, of political citizens. But I think there's also a, a more general psychological importance to hope. Hope uh, is touches upon the things which matter most to all of us. Hope as that which is a movement towards things which are difficult but possible to achieve, touches on all of the things that we care most about, the things which are most noble, uh, our most noble endeavors as human beings. All of these are things that we hope for. And that hope seems to play a kind of constellating role in terms of our personalities and in terms of our moral agency. So hope plays or fails to play a role in bringing into integration and coherence the various competing desires, visions, aspirations of our lives. But there are two very general reasons why we should talk about hope. Why should a systematic theologian talk about hope? Well, two properly theological reasons. First of all, hope in a sense embodies the very essence of the theological task. Theology itself is a work of hope, uh, not only in the foundational sense that one Peter talks of, of uh, giving an account of the hope that is within us, almost as if our hope is more visible than our faith, and therefore it's that which people will ask the theologian to give an account of. And not only in that sense, uh, but also in the sense that crucial, I think, in the practice of hope is the discipline of letting God be God and, and taking our responsibility uh, for what we can do. To paraphrase Nicholas Lash, the theology has this twofold task of weaning us off our residual idolatries and secondly, purifying our desires. And those to that twofold end of theology, uh, as practiced by the systematic theologians, seem to me to resonate with the action of hope, which directs our hopes to God alone, ultimately, weans us off all of the provi provisional hopes um, and coherences that are merely anticipatory, and directs our orders, our desires uh, towards God as the sole satisfier. So theology itself is a work of hope, theology as hope, I've put it on the slides. But I also think there's a sense in which we might see theology as hope enabled, a kind of way of speaking about God, which is made possible by the fact that we have hope, hope as it were, opening up a space in which we can talk about God in a new uh, and different manner. So I want to suggest that hope makes possible a certain kind of theological discourse, that it opens up a space in particular for what I want to call the graced imagination. And I'm thinking here of uh, a contemporary philosopher of hope, Luke Burvins, who's argued that a crucial part of hope is the kind of mental imagination, a mental imagining of a future in which we possess a particular good. And so I want to argue later that hope actually enables and makes possible a kind of theological discourse. Now, as somebody who uh, preaches and teaches a lot about hope, uh, one of the surprising features of contemporary literature is just how uh, many contemporary theologians and philosophers mount a systematic critique of hope. There are those who see hope as in some way either sub-rational or as morally inappropriate in the face of extreme suffering. And often these thinkers are inspired by the, the group that recur called the masters of, of suspicion, post-enlightenment thinkers like Nietzsche, Freud, and Marx. And often they've tended to see hope as a kind of anesthetizing force, uh, which leads to a kind of quietism. Hope as something which is a, an anesthetic that endlessly postpones the arrival of a promised emancipation. In whichever picture of eschatology they may have, 
Hope is something which denies the already element in the already but not yet. We might see three different forms of the critique of hope in contemporary literature. One sees hope as a projection. And that's to say that uh, when we look at history, we're kind of programmed to read history in a kind of Hegelian way. In the same way that our minds pick up coherences in the world, we're trained to see faces, we're trained and uh, therefore we see faces where there aren't really faces and other shapes where there aren't really those shapes. Uh, similarly, hope is a kind of projection. And when we look at history, we like to see history as continually improving. And therefore we project the structure of hope onto our telling of the story of human history and undue Hegelian influence. A second critique of hope sees hope as exculpatory. Those of us who have hope that, uh, uh, and particularly religious forms of hope, are in, in some sense excusing ourselves of our responsibility and our part in global injustice. We're making ourselves feel better uh, by hoping for a distant emancipation. So it alleviates our feelings of guilt and it uh, means that we don't have to take responsibility for changing the world for the better. And the third critique of hope is hope as an imposition. Uh, a lot of, of scholars, particularly attending to uh, the ways in which uh, Western uh, uh, academics, particularly white male academics, interpret the experience of those in the global south, will often impose hope either as an obligation, um, the explicit obligation that those, uh, the, the, you know, we actually tell people they, they shouldn't lack hope or implicitly we impose it upon people um, as, as a kind of, of obligation. We read hope into situations of acute suffering where actually to embrace hopelessness would be a more hu human, more responsible morally and politically uh, and uh, appropriate uh, response. And finally, uh, another critique of hope that we find is the idea that hope in some way excludes radical solidarity. To suggest that hope is a good thing is to put a barrier uh, between ourselves and the hopeless. It's to avoid the demanding practice of radical solidarity with the hopeless. And that kind of radical solidarity demands that we enter not only into their suffering in an abstract sense, but concretely into their experience of hopelessness. Now, however these, um, critiques of hope draw attention to some of the moral ambiguities in uh, the way in which the rhetoric of hope has been used. Uh, I'll mount a more sustained defense uh, of hope against these critiques later. But for now, it has to be said that hope cannot be plausibly denied as a phenomenon of enormous human and political significance. It's one that plays an important motivating role in our moral decision, moral and political uh, decision making. And so among those uh, contemporary defenders of hope, there are those who draw attention to hope and analyze it in terms of desire functioning in the domain of uncertainty. This account of hope, this analysis of hope is so common in the philosophical literature, uh, particularly analytical literature, that it's come to be known as the orthodox view uh, of hope. And uh, interestingly, the orthodox view of hope is highly cognitive and portrays hope in terms of a kind of audacious belief. Hope as a kind of audacious, daring belief, um, which is comprised of a pairing of belief and desire. So these are highly intellectualist accounts of hope, which focus on the epistemic and the cognitive. Hope is almost, in fact, reduced to the, uh, the category of audacious belief or as a kind of intellectual expression of a more basic desire. This is the idea of a pairing of belief and desire, a desire for something which is good and a belief that that good is possible but not absolutely certain. So a necessary and sufficient account of hope on this account is that we want something and we believe that the probability value of that event occurring 
is greater than zero, but less than one. Well, uh, this is good enough as a definition of hope for relatively trivial cases. It's good enough to give an account of ways in which we use hope in a kind of very reduced sense in our daily, uh, daily life. We say, you know, I hope the weather is good. I hope the train is on time. I hope you can all hear me. A belief desire pair is more or less good enough, I think, to cope with those kind of trivial senses of uh, the word hope, the way in which we use hope in our daily life. But it does miss, I think, crucial elements of the more significant aspects of hope and the more significant, existentially significant ways in which we use the language of hope. First of all, one of the things it misses is that when we talk of hope and we, our, our existential hopes for something, we're implicitly acknowledging our own incapacity to bring that about. We're acknowledging our dependence upon webs of relationship, upon good fortune, uh, upon divine providence, whatever it may be, but something which is fundamentally beyond our control. When we really hope, we are relying upon some external factors more than simply the internal pairing of belief and desire. And secondly, it misses the character of hope, which I think is most significant to our kind of phenomenology of hope. And that's to say the commitment element of hope. When we say that we really hope for something, we're kind of leaning into that experience. We've made a resolution to lean into that possibility. And often that possibility remains very small or remote. So belief, desire, pairing, struggle to account for the really existentially significant kinds of hope, and in particular, um, fails to account for what's been called hoping against hope. These are moments of real profound hope, where um, uh, a hope which concerns some kind of deep existential threat, whether to the individual's welfare or to, to their entire value system, uh, and it's a hope that concerns that existential threat in the context of extreme improbability. Somebody hopes against hope when they're hoping for something which is really deeply existentially insignificant, and yet the, the chances of that hope being realized are extremely improbable. Now, what's interesting about cases of hope against hope is that uh, it, somebody who has the same belief and the same desire doesn't necessarily have the same hope. So in the, the, the classic example which is given here is somebody who is diagnosed with uh, a terminal untreatable cancer um, and they're given the possibility of participating within um, a, a drug trial um, which would potentially discover a, a new cure. Now, somebody could, uh, let's say both of the uh, people who are invited to participate in that trial, both believe uh, the same thing, that they have uh, a, a serious condition and that the likelihood of uh, the, a new cure being discovered is very minimal. Both, of course, desire the same thing, that's to say, to be cured, but their hopes could be radically different. One person could join the scheme in the hope of finding the cure. One person could join the scheme in the hope of simply participating in something useful, making, uh, giving some meaning to the final moments of their life. Somebody with, this, with hope could refuse to participate in the scheme and instead choose to make, um, make other arrangements to perhaps um, draw their life to an end in another meaningful way. All have the same belief and desire but all have different hopes. And so the case of hoping against hope draws attention to the really complex character of hope, particularly in these most acute um, existential situations. And so uh, Margaret Urban Walker talks of hope as more of a syndrome. It's a collection of things, including beliefs and desires, but also including perceptions, commitments, um, and other existential baggage, such as memory and um, certain types of emotional uh, experience. Hope then has this much more complex reality to it than simply the pairing of belief and desire. 
Now, one of the uh, ways in which philosophers have attempted to move beyond the belief desire account of hope is by drawing attention to what's been called radical hope. And this is um, hope as it moves through the domain of the failure of knowledge. And it can be usefully understood by comparing hope, hope, sorry, hopes, hope, and radical hope. It's an idea really that's been uh, developed by a philosopher called Jonathan Lear, who I will talk about in, the, in a moment. But we can understand it, uh, these, this threefold division in the following way. Hopes in the pluralized sense of hopes are hopes that, their hopes that relate to particular expectations and desires about particular concrete realities within our life. I can hope that I have a friend. I can hope that uh, the train is uh, on time. I can hope that you all can hear me. This is a kind of uh, basic understanding of hopes in the plural as hoping that something is the case. But those hopes that depend upon hope in the singular, hoping in. And in the singular, hoping in is the kind of interpersonal and dynamic reality that supports and gives rise to uh, the hopes of our life. So hope in this singular sense is hope in. We hope in a particular interpersonal dynamic framework by which we make sense of the world. But in cases where that framework fails, there is a third type of hope, which is radical hope. This is a kind of hope that endures the absolute collapse of hope in this second sense, an absolute collapse of hope in. Uh, and it's a hope which is anticipated and it anticipates a future possible revival of hope in that second sense. But as yet, it fails to have sufficient categories to articulate that possibility uh, in a cognitive way. There are no, no longer any cultural frameworks which provide for the possibility of articulating hope um, in that sense of hoping in. And yet there remains this inchoate possibility of a revival which is known as radical hope. So radical hope is a hope that endures the failure of our relational systems and our structures of knowledge. Radical hope and the theory of radical hope has been developed by a psychoanalyst philosopher at the University of Chicago called Jonathan Lear. And uh, Lear develops his account of radical hope in a number of places, but perhaps most accessibly and interestingly uh, in his analysis of the cultural history of the Crow Nation, a uh, First Nation um, community in uh, the kind of Montana area of the United States. And in particular, the way in which they endured the collapse of their culture as a result of being confined to the reservation and the destruction of very culturally significant practices, uh, including those which gave fundamental meaning and significance to uh, their community existence. And uh, Plenty Ku, who's pictured here and was the leader of the Crow, uh, gave a very extended interview shortly before his death, in which he told the story of the Crow Nation up until the cultural devastation of being confined to the reservation. And then he concludes it by saying, after that, nothing happened. And when he was interrogated, well, you know, something must have happened. You know, you've lived many decades now on the reservation and Crow culture has in many respects continued. Plenty Coup insisted that this history was accessible equally to everybody, that it wasn't necessary to ask him, but it could simply be described by anybody. And Lear interprets this as a shift from the first person where Plenty Coup and the Crow had a privileged vantage point over their own history to the third person where that kind of subjective access to history had been lost. And the great uh, achievement of Plenty Coup was to give his uh, community a sense of radical hope, a hope 
in the restoration of uh, Crow identity, Crow subjectivity as somehow enduring, even after that cultural devastation, which had deprived them of the ability even to tell their own story. And so in that loss of subjectivity, the radical hope of Plenty Coup is one which is incomprehensible, which endures the structural loss of hope, and which lives, we might say, in the nevertheless. Just as Karl Barth said that the, the, uh, the resurrection is, stands to all the, uh, all the sin and disorder of the world as a great nevertheless, so radical hope stands against all of the destruction of our subjectivity with this great nevertheless. Despite that, nevertheless, there is a way of continuing to hope. So why do I bring this up and why do I uh, want to link Aquinas to this? Well, partly because I see in that nevertheless a great opportunity for theologians to reflect upon the structure of our faith as leaning in to that divine nevertheless. But also because I see in the very structure of radical hope as it's articulated by Plenty Coup, uh, by Jonathan Lear, a kind of anticipation of certain Thomistic features of hope. So on to the second part of the lecture in which I want to talk about Aquinas on uh, hope. Aquinas uh, defines hope. Uh, hope is for Aquinas, as we'll see in a minute, both a passion and a virtue. But there are elements to the passion of hope which are worth uh, considering in some detail. Hope is a movement towards a future good which is difficult but possible to obtain. And each of those elements will become more important as I proceed, but I want to really focus in what I say on the character of hope as a movement towards the future good, which is difficult but possible to obtain. Notice the difficulty element is still uh, present from the cognitive definition of hope in terms of belief desire pairing, this idea of, of hope as pertaining to things which are not certain but are arduous uh, to obtain uh, remains. But in particular, hope in Aquinas is, I think, ordered not just to the general difficulties of life that might impede our achieving uh, goods, but to the good itself as arduous. That's to say, what makes a good arduous in this account is not that there are lots of obstacles towards it per se, but that the good itself is very difficult to obtain. The good itself is one of the greatest uh, goods that we could obtain for ourselves. And finally, I think it's worth dwelling on the, uh, the fact that the hope orders us towards things which we are to obtain. It's not enough for us simply to know that there is something out there. We have to be moving towards the attainment of it in the same way that uh, knowing that there is water downstairs doesn't satisfy my thirst. Simply knowing that there is a good out there doesn't satisfy our desires. We have to move towards it in a way that anticipates our possession of it. The good is actually something which we uh, can obtain. And a movement, uh, because uh, the, that good to which we are moving is something which is not present to us in the way that, uh, let's say, joy, the emotion of joy, uh, concerns a good that we already possess, which is already present to us. Our hopes concern joys uh, of the future goods which are not yet obtained. So I say Aquinas uh, speaks of hope as both a passion and emotion and a theological virtue. But let's talk about hope in the first instance as a passion. Well, those of you who know Aquinas on the emotions will know that Aquinas divides the emotions into the concupiscible and the irascible. And hope is an irascible passion because it concerns something which is difficult to obtain. It's not merely reactive to something which is directly in front of us, but it concerns movement towards something which is arduous and difficult to obtain. And as an emotion, uh, the passion of hope is one of this set of ways in which we are able to respond to our environment as animals uh, with uh, possessed of, um, an, of appetites which are below our intellect. Uh, 
So hope emerges almost as an, an instant reaction out of our, um, our appetites. It, our appetites stretch out forward towards the good uh, that we wish to obtain. But we can already, even in the emotion of hope, uh, hope to obtain something not by our own power, but by the help and assistance of others. And that will become really important when we talk about the theological virtue of hope. And Aquinas thinks that the emotion of hope is found in particular in the young and in the drunk. In the young, because they have plenty of future ahead of them in which they might hope to realize that good, but they also have little behind them in their memories. They have little experience of defeat, and so perhaps they tend to um, they tend to downplay the difficulty of achieving uh, an arduous good, and so they're very they're, they're very likely to uh, be animated by that emotion of hope. And uh, similarly, the young uh, have expansive hearts, which are lively and liable to movement and hope, therefore, as one of these movements is something which particularly characterizes the young by what Aquinas calls the heat of their nature. And similarly, those who are drunk are liable to underestimate difficulty and uh, are liable to be lively, to be movable and to have hot natures. It's interesting to just reflect, um, although this, this might seem amusing that the emotion of of hope is found in particular in the young and the, the drunk. When you go to uh, travel through places of extreme poverty, you usually see three things and maybe nothing else uh, in, uh, in, a, in a, a, a place of poverty, but there usually is a school, a pub or a bar and a church, all of them in their own distinct way, places of hope. Some hopes good, some hopes not so good. So hope as an emotion is this kind of appetitive, moving out, stretching towards the good. But hope also exists as a theological virtue. That's to say it's one of those powers, those stable powers, which are infused into our soul by God to enable us to penetrate into the things of, uh, of heaven and to enable our faculties to commence already our life of beatitude here on earth. Now, uh, faith is a perfection of the intellect to grasp the truth about God and to judge rightly about uh, divine things. Hope, on the other hand, perfects the will to desire God and to really rely upon God's help. And charity perfects the will so as to love God above all things. And in so doing, reorders, reconfigures, restructures the life of virtue within the Christian soul. And these virtues are theological in three senses. One sense is by their origination. They are infused into our souls as a gift from God rather than habituated by human effort. Secondly, they're theological in terms of their object. That's to say they order us to God and only relatively to intermediate things. They have as their proper object uh, God himself. And thirdly, because we know about them, by divine revelation, by the fact that God has told us about them. So these are gifts which are given by God for us to enjoy God, but they are something which we possess humanly and enjoy in this life. Now, the theological virtue of hope only has formal similarities with the passion of hope. Uh, it moves not by the instantaneous reaction of a passion, but by a judgment which is prompted and inspired by God. So there's a really considerable difference here uh, of, of kind between the passion of hope, the emotion of hope, and the theological virtue of hope. The passion of hope only gives its name and its general diagnostic features to the, to the theological virtue. And interestingly, the theological virtue of hope only becomes a virtue as a theological virtue. Uh, the natural equivalent to hope is not a virtue uh, because it can point us towards the wrong. It can misdirect us. We can hope for something which is actually not an excellence. A hope can be misguided and therefore it lacks the character 
of a virtue. Instead, the natural impulses of hope are perfected by the virtue of magnanimity and held in check by the virtue, restrained by the virtue of humility. So the theological virtue of hope becomes a virtue only insofar as it is a, a theological virtue, and it's ordered towards God himself. When we hope, we hope for God himself, not just for the things of God, but we hope to actually possess God himself. Hope then as a theological virtue of the will is a kind of habitual leaning into, leaning on the help of God. And it's sometimes seen as a kind of imperfect love of God because it belongs to our will, but we can only hope for ourselves. And so therefore hope is perfected in a sense by charity, which opens the theological virtue of hope out to uh, hope for others, to loving others as we love God with one and the self-same love. So hope is this kind of habitual dependence and leaning on the assistance of God. Now there's a, a relationship between each of these three theological virtues which becomes important when we're comparing it to radical hope. Hope in the theological virtue sense depends upon faith, is perfected by the theological virtue of charity, and is possessed of a kind of certitude which emerges from its relationship to charity and faith. It's the intellect's ascent to revelation by faith which allows the will to move towards that which faith promises. Faith therefore gives the basis upon which hope can be confident and non-complacent expectation in divine assistance. And charity folds back, as I say, on hope and unpacks it, opening it out to a new social dimension. And the certitude of hope is a certitude which is distinct from the certitude of faith. It's also distinct from the certitude of an event. Rather, it's the certitude of a tendency. Hope has a certitude in its tendency towards the absolute good rather than in its attainment of that absolute good. So hope is certain on account of its tendency towards God by the assistance of God. Important in all of this has been the idea of uh, hope as a movement. And in the first place, we might see this movement in two respects. Firstly, as a divinizing movement, a movement which makes us like to God. And secondly, as a humanizing movement, a movement which makes us more human and more humane. As a divinizing movement, uh, it's worth comparing hope to faith. Faith is ordered to God as both the material object and the formal object of our knowledge. And what that means is that we know God by God himself. We know God, the material object, and we know about uh, God's perfection. That's the material object because we're taught by the authority of God himself the formal object of faith. So there's a twofold uh, reliance of faith on God. God as that which towards the virtue uh, is ordered, that which is known, and, and God as that by which God is known. And similarly, in the case of hope, there's a similar twofold uh, objectivity, a divine objectivity to the virtue of faith. But because hope is about the appetite, about, it's about the will rather than about the intellect, it's better to see this in terms of final causality and efficient causality. God is the final cause of our hope because God is the good which we intend to obtain. God is that which is promised to us in our hope. But God is also the efficient cause of our um, hope because God is the help which is given to us to obtain that end. So in other words, it's not an excellence of hope for something to hope for something uh, through our own power of delivery. Perfect theological hope hopes precisely as God 
is our help, since God alone can deliver the final object of hope, namely God himself. So this movement towards God in hope, uh, with God as both the final and the efficient cause of our movement, is a, a divinizing movement, a movement which draws us to share in the life of the triune God for all eternity. But we might also see hope as a humanizing movement. The movement which is proper to the theological virtue of hope is one which is distinctively human. And especially when animated by charity, the movement of hope is humanizing with respect to those around us. It's not just a selfish uh, process of us becoming more human, but it also, when opened out by charity, humanizes the world around us. And this can be seen from considering the character of human beatitude relative to angelic and divine beatitude. Now, God, as subsistent beatitude, is beatitude in himself. He doesn't attain beatitude by any movement or indeed by any other means. God simply is beatitude in his own very being. Angels, on the other hand, because they're pure spirits, move to God, move to their beatitude by a single movement uh, and they, by a single unthematic act at the moment of their creation, they move towards their eternal enjoyment um, of, of God. But human beings, uh, as material and spiritual, we move to our beatitude through multiple movements. Uh, and therefore, because our multiple movements towards beatitude are spread across time and history, we rely upon a virtue, the virtue, the theological virtue of hope, by which all of those disparate movements can be drawn together, constellated, and given an integrity. So as you can see, the account that I'm drawing out of Aquinas places a great emphasis on the movement character of hope. Hope as future-oriented is ordered, uh, is, is a movement of our souls towards God. And this is seen in the particular character of faith as made for the status viatorum, the state of the wayfarer. Like faith, when we reach our end in heaven, hope will pass away. Love will endure as that which binds us to God, but hope will pass away when that which we hope for is finally obtained. And we can see this movement character in the two principal sins which are opposed to hope, presumption and uh, despair. And both of these, I think, can be interpreted as a refusal to move, a refusal to make that journey towards God. Presumption is that defect which overlooks divine judgment, which rests assured that the final good, the difficult good will come to us, God will give it to us, and therefore uh, presuming upon the divine mercy. And if you like, presumption is the demand that the obtained good come to us. We stay still and demand that the good come to us and is given to us where we are. And despair gives up movement altogether. Despair overlooks the divine mercy and focuses excessively on the act of divine justice and therefore simply gives up, abandons movement, gives up the task of being human. And so the defects, the vices that are opposed to hope are fundamentally about refusing to move into the future, refusing to take that step even once our hopes have been devastated, that step in radical hope uh, into the future, which we know by faith. So as a result of this movement character, we might see hope as having two elements to it. On the one hand, it's an affirmation. It is uh, affirming the certitude of the tendency moving towards the good. Hope affirms that there is a beatitude, that there is a, a kingdom which is to come and which lives in that excess over sinful history. In no cheap sense, hope does affirm that consummation will come. And therefore, if consummation has not yet come, 
then we've not yet reached the end. If things are not yet consummated, then the end has not yet been realized by God. But equally important is the character of hope as a refusal, a refusal of any kind of premature foreclosure. And that includes a refusal of any false utopianism, any easy idea of the, the perfectibility of the human community. It is a refusal of those kind of false expectations, false hopes, false ideas that we can bring ourselves to perfection and fulfillment. But it also excludes the kind of foreclosure that it premature foreclosure that um, uh, characterizes despair, that refuses movement and embraces quietism. And this refusal to accept anything less than the closure which God has provided is, I think, deeply characteristic and important uh, character uh, of hope. And it's easy to see how this virtue of theological virtue of hope could be expanded into an ecclesial virtue, how it could take flesh in the form of the church. The church as that community which emb embodies within itself the affirmation of the kingdom of God and the refusal of, king of, of uh, kingdom which are characterized by uh, structures of power and oppression. So how does this Thomistic account of uh, theological virtue of hope link with the account of radical hope that I developed earlier? Well, I hope you can already see the resonances. In fact, we might say that for, for Thomas, all virtuous hope is necessarily radical hope. And crucial to this is that the certitude of hope is not that of a state of affairs, but of a tendency. In other words, that our hope is certain in this limited sense does not entail that we are possessed of the categories by which the eschaton can be thoroughly understood, articulated and comprehended. Though it is incohated in the life of the church and in our faith and hope, the eschaton will still arrive as a rupture and will still arrive, therefore, as something which is at least partially surprising and revelatory. And like radical hope, Thomistic hope endures the breakdown of natural hopes. It endures the breakdown of all those provisional coherences by which we live. Like radical hope, Thomistic hope is a living into a future possibility which we do not yet fully comprehend. And like radical hope, Thomistic hope invokes this graced imagination of beginning to intuit something which we cannot fully articulate. But importantly, Thomistic hope differs from radical hope in Leah's account, because although it's apophatic, although it's surrounded and shrouded uh, in the darkness of unknowability on account of the provisionality of our faith, it isn't indeterminate. Thomistic hope is ordered to a determinate, albeit unknowable end, namely God himself. And so Thomistic hope is able to secure an account of its intrinsic rationality, I think, much more easily than a simple uh, uh, account of a philosophical, natural account of radical hope can do. Now, I just want to uh, draw in, in the last five minutes, some additions to this Thomistic picture of hope, which I think might help us to build and flesh out the picture which um, I've drawn out from Aquinas. And the first addition that I want to draw uh, is a question uh, of whether we can articulate a certain primacy to hope. As I noted in, in the account of the relationship between the theological virtues, hope depends in the order of generation on faith. And there's this folding back of charity into hope, which expands it outwards in a social dimension. But I wonder if there's a similar folding back that we might see between hope and faith, even though they belong to difficult, different faculties. Isn't there a similar, might we not articulate a similar kind of folding back in which hope in some way opens out and makes richer and more potent our faith? And in fact, we might see a kind of hope structure within the very act of faith itself. 
Uh, faith is, the act of faith is one that moves by a command of the will, uh, the commandment of love, uh, and it, it uh, moves by that command, and that command is necessary for faith to retain its meritorious um, and uh, free character. But the object of faith, uh, namely the divine essence, is not present substantially to the intellect in the act of faith, but rather present by a kind of anticipation. And that presence by anticipation seems to me to be an echo of the kind of anticipation which is proper to the form uh, of hope. And so we might see built into faith, in fact, perhaps even built into all forms of knowledge, a kind of hope-like structure. This is something which a, a number of um, Heideggerian-influenced uh, philosophers have drawn attention to, and particularly those influenced by Gabriel Marcel. Another thing that uh, we might need into artemistic, another uh, instinct we might need into artemistic account of hope is an insight from Karl Rahner and his theology of hope. Now, Rahner's theology of hope is concerned by what he sees as the relative neglect of hope among the theological virtues and a tendency that he sees to define hope relative to a modality of either faith or love. And instead, Rana proposes a distinctive account of hope as almost the most primordial of the theological virtues, proposes an account of hope as the original unifying medium by which faith is faith and uh, love is love. It's that which enables faith to be faith and charity to be charity. And at the heart of Rana's account of hope is what he sees as the radical and uh, the radical and pure uncontrollability of God. Hope, as it were, creates a space within which the uncontrollable God, the God who transcends our comprehension and control, can make himself known. Hope, therefore, has a kind of uh, quasi-disruptive pattern as it eliminates in a systematic way the provisionalities by which we live, and thereby empowers and commands a new exodus into an unknown future. And so for Rana, the basic modality of hope is an attitude towards the eternal, and hope is a kind of locus in which God can show himself. Now, what we can take positively from Rana, I think, is the way in which he underlines that the logic of hope depends upon an economy of gift in which God gives himself to us uh, repeatedly. The, the whole dynamic of radical hope only really works if there is something coming over the horizon towards us, a, a, a gift which is being given to us from beyond our control. But negatively, hope uh, for Rana endures eternally since even when God is possessed by the beatific vision, he remains purely and radically uncontrollable. God in the beatific vision is not brought under our control, and therefore hope retains this character of a locus within which God can reveal himself, even once we possess God in the beatific vision. And that's unacceptable for a Thomist for two reasons. One, uh, because it implies that there is some difficulty in heaven, and secondly, because it implies that there is something which is not fully satisfied, some desire on our part which is not fully satisfied. Anyway, we can talk more about Rana in the discussion if people want to. And the final uh, strand that I think we could weave into our Thomistic account of hope is from St John of the Cross. John of the Cross saw hope as pertaining not primarily to the intellect, but to the memory. Whereas faith causes a kind of void within the intellect for John, it creates this darkness within the intellect so that the intellect can possess God. John understands hope to be an emptying out of the memory so that we can be freed of the encumbrances of our memory in order to possess God himself. Now, the nature of that darkness and that emptying, it must be stressed, is uh, that not a simple absence, but rather the presence of something which is much, uh, much too great and glorious, too dazzling to be seen or taken in. But nonetheless, the idea 
that hope has some involvement of the memory is I think something which Thomists could benefit from further attention to. So how can we draw all of these strands of, our, uh, of the lecture together? How can we, uh, as Christians struggling to maintain hope as a discipline, uh, continue on this movement, this journey towards God? Well, one concrete way, and Aquinas talks of prayer as the interpreter of hope, is, I think, in the celebration of the Eucharist. Because it's in the celebration of the Eucharist as a visible manifestation of our hope that we both remember the, uh, the, the past, the sacrificial self-offering of Christ, but also remember the future. We orientate ourselves towards a future which is already made present in that Eucharistic self-offering. And so the fulfillment of our hope is present sacramentally in the celebration of the Eucharist. And so by a disciplined, rigorous celebration of the Eucharist, we can purify our memories, enliven our appetites, strengthen our intellects, and above all, fortify ourselves for this journey back to God, making our own this refusal of all anticipatory coherences and this affirmation that God will not disappoint, that he, will give, that he does offer himself to us, and that he gives himself to us not only as the object of our desires, but as the help by which we are to achieve that. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Father Oliver. So grateful for your pastoral approach, pastoral care and sensitivity in a fragile time. This is not a gung-ho hope that you offer us or an insensitivity to human misery and your engagement with philosophers and also with traditional cultures has not been confined in any way to the Western canon. Um, and certainly I think what I take away is how Aquinas seems to amplify Karl Barth's great nevertheless of the resurrection in that great hope that we do not have to push upwards to risk becoming the tragedy of Sisyphus, but rather we are taken up and taken up in the great hope which is made present in the Holy Eucharist. So thank you so very much for that marvellous lecture. I'm sure there will be a lot of um, comments and questions coming in. Uh, I'm now gonna stop recording